Howdy. This video is on atomic spectroscopy. The energy states for electrons and atoms depend on the electrostatic interaction between the electron and the nucleus. Now, as you increase the number of protons in the nucleus, you're strengthening that electrostatic attraction, you're lowering the energy state. And so if you notice, as you go across the periodic table, the 1s orbital is going down. And again, because it's seen a bigger nuclear charge, stronger attraction, lower energy state. Also, we have what's referred to as shielding, and that's why the S is lower energy than the P because the S is less shielded. And so the energy states depend on the number of protons in the nucleus, also depends on the number of electrons in the atom. And so each element has a unique set of energy levels for their, electro their electrons. Now we can use this to actually be able to identify the different elements using atomic spectroscopy. And so atomic spectroscopy is really pretty cool, very helpful. We can use it to identify what elements are in our sample. And so if we have an atom at, in its ground state, we can actually cause an electron to get excited. So for instance, in this example, we're going from a 2p to a 3s orbital. If we shine light that has photons equal of energy equal to that energy difference, and so if it absorbs that photon, then the electron does get excited. Now, once the electron is excited, eventually it will fall back down into its ground state. And when it relaxes back down, it will release a photon with an energy equal to that energy difference. And so in this case, this is an example of absorption spectroscopy. You're seeing what light is absorbed to excite the electron. In this case, it's actually emission spectroscopy. You excite your sample using, say, like a flame or electricity, and then you measure the light uh, released when it goes back down to its ground state. Then when you're looking at emission spectroscopy, you, know, you excite your sample, again, using, say, like a flame, and then you see what light is released. And so the energy of the excited state has to be equal to the energy of the ground state plus the photon release. The photon has to equal the energy difference between the two states of your sample. And so in emission spectroscopy, you excite your sample. Again, you can do it using electricity. You can use a flame. You can use an in inductively coupled plasma. You then measure the light released by your sample. You separate out using either a gradient or a prism, and then you get these lines. And these lines correspond to the energies released from the sample, which correspond to the differences in energy of the different states. If a high voltage is applied to an element in the gas phase, the element emits light. Using a prism, we can split the light into its component colors. Every element emits a distinct set of colors unique to that element. But again, every element has a unique set of colors because the energy states are different for each element. And so here's the emission spectra for hydrogen, mercury, and neon. Um, it's kind of cool for a neon sign. You know, we only see one color with our eye, but there's actually 21 distinct lines um, in that spectrum. Here's a few more emission spectra. Again, each of these colored, colored lines correspond to a photon with a specific energy, and that energy is equal to specific energy differences between different states. And so an element can actually have many different states that are um, excited and fall back down. And so in terms of emission spectroscopy, you excite your sample, for example, using a flame or a charged tube, and then you measure the light coming off. Now in absorption spectroscopy, you have a light source and you shine it through your sample and you see which light is absorbed. And it's kind of cool, the absorption spectra is actually going to be similar to your emission spectra. And so on top, we have the emission spectra, and on bottom, we have the absorption spectra. And so if you notice, the black lines of the absorption spectra are opposite to a color line of the emission spectra. And so the lines that you see in the emission spectra are equal to the, line, the black lines that you see for the absorption spectra. So the light that the sample emits when it falls back down has exactly the same energy as the light the sample absorbs in the ground state. And so you can use either emission spectra or absorption spectra. And so atomic spectroscopy is really pretty cool. You can use it to qualitatively and quantitatively determine perhaps 70 different elements. 
Um, you can sensitivities of part per million or part per billion range. And if you want to know what's in your sample, atomic spectroscopy is very, very good. It's actually kind of interesting. The first evidence of helium was from a spectrum of the sun measured during a solar eclipse in 1868. It wasn't until 1895 that it was discovered that helium was actually an element. So think about it, helium was actually discovered in spectroscopy of the sun before it was actually discovered on Earth. That's because it was a noble gas, it doesn't react with any compounds, and so it's very hard to detect. Now fireworks use the same idea as atomic spectroscopy. And so in fireworks, you're exciting the sample by burning it. That's the combustion and explosion. And so once the electrons are excited, eventually they fall back down. And when they fall back down, when they relax to a lower energy state, they'll release a photon equal to the difference, with an energy equal to the difference in energy. And so different colors of fireworks are actually due to different elements. When fireworks burn, the heat of the combustion reaction provides energy to allow electrons in the metal atoms to move into different subshells that are farther from the atom's nuclei. Those electrons quickly move back into their original subshells, releasing energy as they return. That energy is released as photons of electromagnetic radiation. If the emitted radiation is in the visible region of the spectrum, we see color, and the color is unique to the compound in the fireworks. And so again, the color is unique to the compound in fireworks because each element has a unique set of electron energy levels. And so in general, green is due to barium, blue, copper, red, strontium, and yellow from sulfur. Fireworks are getting more sophisticated all the time, to the point that some might think of them as works of art. People uh, don't think uh, that fireworks is an art expression. They think of fireworks as bang, 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 and a lot of noise, but it's, a, it's like painting. Alberto Navarro, who started as a painter, now creates major fireworks displays around the world. But a sky painter needs a palette of vibrant colors, and that has just recently become possible. Especially in the last 10 years, there has been a big change, and now they are, it's possible to create any, any uh, color in the spectrum of light. And also colors that are balanced, that, uh, that they have the same luminance. As shown on PBS's Nova, Fireworks get their colors from the burning of metal-based compounds. Strontium creates a red flame, barium green, and copper blue. Blues in particular are still difficult to produce, even though fireworks have been around for centuries. That's because copper compounds can be unstable at high temperature. So chemists are constantly refining their formulas to create a pure, deep blue. You can burn uh, too much and then you will wash the, the, the depth of the, of the color. It has been the challenge for uh, fireworks uh, manufacturers during many years. But with the help of a little chemistry, you'll be watching the vivid trail of the rocket's blue glare. I'm Brad Closer. It's really kind of cool, and again, different colors correspond to different energy levels. And so a lot of research in trying to get the right color, it also, the color also depends on the temperature. So you don't want the explosion to be too hot or too cold. And so there's actually different ways of exciting the sample so it releases light. And so we saw that we could use a charge tube like in a neon light or combustion like in terms of a, of a firework. We can also just use methanol. And so if we burn a salt, in methanol, it will excite the electron. Eventually, the electron goes back down, emits a photon equal to the energy difference. If we pour methanol onto sodium chloride and ignite it, the flame produced is yellow in color. If instead of using sodium chloride, we use boric acid, a compound made of boron, hydrogen, and oxygen, the flame produced is green in color. Each salt imparts a characteristic color. The emission of light by heated or burning objects provide important clues to our understanding of atoms. And just like a neon light, we can also um, put electricity through a pickle. Now the reason you can put electricity through a pickle is because it has a salt solution inside, and so salt solutions can actually um, carry a current. 
Now the orange glow of the pickle is actually due to the sodium ions being excited and then relaxing back down. And so it's really kind of cool. We can identify different elements based on atomic spectroscopy. And we can do that because each element has a unique set of energy levels, which are due to electrostatic interaction between electrons and nucleus, which depends on the number of protons in the nucleus and the number of electrons. I hope that was helpful.